TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are live. By the time you see this, we won't be. So just leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Right behind me, you see it. Warning screen. Probably relevant. Maybe not. Uh, don't forget, twitch.com is where you can catch the live streams. Names at the bottom of the screen. We do got Patreon where we post stuff that we can't watch on YouTube. And that's it, right? This is Wolf the World. Living with migrants and crossing the channel and dinghy. Royal Marine Undercover. Talk to me. Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. <laughs> Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use. I'm not going to let that play because I know YouTube can't hear it. Talk to me. What is happening? Play. It would help if I press play. Let's come up with a backstory, which we mentioned earlier, and go undercover. We hit the surf, it was throwing us around, it pitch black, thrown around, and then if man chan he saw his skin for my able to delete Marines come all time. Balls, homeless, protected, the Because. You're gonna be a bear, you may as well. In 17 years, Rob, you're a four, or why you can't be a nurse, you're four tall. If Vladimir joining us, I'm bear, you may as well be a grizzly. Lee West, thank you for joining us on British Thought Leaders. Uh, hey, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. You've led an incredible life so far. In 17 years, Royal Marines Commando, four tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. Thank you for your service. You're a father who runs a business. You started charity. And you're a best-selling author. So it's your autobiography, Never Above, Never Below. But you also wrote um, several other books where you kind of go on a mission, if you like, and then write about it. I wanted to start talking to you about one of those. Mm. So you went over to Paris to the migrant camp. You spent a week in the migrant camp undercover as a migrant, and then you basically came back on a, on a small boat, as the illegal immigrants do, to the UK. So why did you decide to do this? That's so the journey uh, started with Tramp Face uh, quite a few years ago, which is the name of our projects we do every year, where every year we would go and live homeless uh, for a week on our annual leave with an associated challenge with it. The first one was just living homeless, it was a challenge in itself. And then we decided, well, each year let's keep doing it because we were doing it for charity as well, uh, as well as our own stimulation and awareness. And each year then we decided to keep doing it and thought, well, we'll we can't just do the same thing every year. Let's up, up it each time, put add a, an, a, an extra challenge into it and make it a little bit more interesting and dangerous in some cases. We got to a point where a very topical and polarizing subject of the migrant camps in Paris and Calais. And we thought, well, yeah, we've seen a lot of it on the media. See, we've seen it on YouTube clips and everything else. Let's go there, unannounced, unsupported, turn up and see what is actually going on with our own eyes. So yeah, that that's how- What's his name did this too? Uh, what was, what's dude's name? Bald and Bankrupt did this too, right? <coughs> Tramp face started, we just up the ante each year, and that was topical and dangerous, and we decided to go and give it a bash. What was it like in the migrant camp? What happens there on a daily basis? It was very unnerving uh, to start. Of course, we the realization hit us that we'd put ourselves in this isolated, volatile, notorious camp, which we didn't really know anything about, apart from what we see on the media. So we just turned up in Tent City, and we've got a few uh, friends. This one, there's more than a few. The occupants would discard their unwanted cartons of food from the charity kiosk on the floor around them. This one, there's more than a few. Hundreds of us. Rats. Supporting a whole underground colony. This is this is these mugs big too. These like little little cats. Rats everywhere. Come on, 
Cristiano Ramos. With the homeless stuff, we had cover story, which was really believable on the streets of the UK. We are ex forces. We've found ourselves temporarily homeless, and we're trying to find our feet. We couldn't, of course, do that with the migrant camps because be looking very European, we didn't look like 99% of the occupants. So a cover story in that instance was that we had a good think about it. The one we settled on was that we were deserters from the French Foreign Legion. All right. Which uh, when Paul, uh, my partner in Tramface, came up with this idea, I was like, this is never going to work. And it actually turned out from an instance, it was the one believable story that we did actually have to roll out and did get believed by the locals and not only people in the camp. So we were deserters from the French Foreign Legion who'd jumped the wall because we decided we didn't like it. We were making our way back to the UK, but of course when you join the Legion, they take your documents off you, you your identity. So we couldn't get across the border despite being UK uh, citizens until we could get word to London and the UK that we were British citizens and they did a background check and then sent paperwork over. Yeah, that for sure sounds believable. Nah, that sounds reasonable. If you, if you was in a camp and nobody knew no better, yeah, for sure. Uh, so until that moment, we were homeless, living in Calais. So that was the story. We were just camped out on the border, waiting for word to get across, rather than trying to pretend to be migrants, yeah. which we weren't going to get away with. We, we didn't really stick out as much as we thought we would, because during the daytime, there's a lot of Westerners um, hanging around. Journalists, um, diplomats, officials... Uh, a lot of aid workers, so we weren't the only people who, who, who stuck out. So during the daytime, we, we could we could sort of blend in, although we, we were dressed scruffily and we, we didn't look like a journalist or an official, which probably drew a little bit of suspicion. Probably thought we were undercover police. Um, in fact, they did. We did uh, get approached with that a couple of times. During the evenings, it would, the camp, the mood in the camps would change uh, significantly. Just having a quick swamp inside of the... Uh camp the Sudanese boys who invited us in getting a bit rowdy don't think you heard the singing probably tramp two joining in um, we'll slip into one of the tents soon a lot of aspects of it surprised me a lot of people may look at it and think well this is a camp united in their goals and a big community all helping each other and it's not the reality is it's a collection of warring tribes <laughs> <laughs> a lot of separate little camps with the main belligerents being from Eritrea, uh, Sudan, Somalia, Syria, Afghanistan and uh, Kurdistan. They weren't in harmony, they were arguing with each other. There was a lot of infighting and when the sun went down there's a lot of drinking in the camps which surprised people as well. We got photos of the, the sort of the mess that was there, a lot of drinking. I don't know if, that's not surprising, but that's not surprising. This is a lot of cans though, like brother. Uh, drug use. And uh, as I know, after 17 years in the Marines, when they put a lot of young men, which they predominantly were, in a place together, they're bored because there's nothing else to do apart from sit around the campfire drinking. Inside the Sudanese camp. <laughs> oh my god my fault i said i'm gonna edit that out i said um i never heard a drunken slur in a different language but he's clearly drunk and i don't even know what he's saying but that slur is crazy <laughs> The politics come into it, different backgrounds, different cultures, different countries, and they're all competing as well because <coughs> as much as you may think they're all united, they want to get across the border first. So there is competition there as well. And you put all these, a lot of people look at it from the outside and don't see these inner workings of it. 
and we did get to see it. And there would be a lot of fighting, a lot of uh, arguments, and it would become um, quite volatile after, after dark. You mentioned a lot of young men. I mean, one would assume there's lots of kind of women and children fleeing war and persecution. That's the definition of refugees. Were there not? No. We, 99% of were what I would describe uh, from, as a military term is a fighting age male. Young, healthy, fit men. Maybe so one or two women in the camp the whole time we were there, apart from aid workers and other people, outsiders. And I, I don't, we didn't get to talk to them, so we don't know exactly what their purpose was in the camp. Did you feel under threat? There was some threatening behaviour. I feel like, like, it kind of makes sense to send the men. All right, we're going to send you because you're stronger. You could, you, could, you could manage the trip. These kids and me, I ain't got time for that right now. Send money back after you get a job. And hopefully one day, bring us. Like that's probably the script, right? Um, sometimes it could be just looks, but we'd try and engage with people. We made friends with people as well, so not everyone was hostile towards us. But yeah, we did get a lot of sus suspicion come towards us. Who we'll tried to make friends with us because of, the, because of our appearance. They thought we were Albanians or Europeans, and uh, therefore we were, would be able to help them with, in their goal of getting across, uh, getting trafficked. It's volatile because you never knew if somebody's going to be your friend or your foe in any instance. Good evening, Trump fans. So we are deep into the jungle again. Uh, is this him? The dude that's talking? Or is this him? It's promised. We've um, occupied a tent. Deep inside, so tonight we met back up with the boys, um, the boys from Chad that we met yesterday on to the, uh, yesterday's update. Turns out none of them are from Chad, they were lying to us. They were all from Sudan, really. from Barry, yeah, Barry, <laughs> all from the <laughs> right, well, not from Chad basically. We spent um, the night in there, go back in, sat on the fire with them, a couple of beers just to blend in, obviously. About to make our exit from the tent. Uh, don't think the boys are up yet. It's raining. We might be might be coming from sat round uh, the campfire. Um, see what happens. Middles. Little Sudan, callous friend. Okay. <coughs> they had kids and everything. It's clear. I feel like people are willing to risk their life, their freedom, just everything that they, their whole existence to get to a better situation. That's, whether it be men, women, or children, like this, still a high risk. This is no way to live. I know people get, probably get sick and like, People probably get the flu and don't make it up out of this. From the flu. So we were on a party last night. Oh yeah, it was us. So after a week there, you set off kind of coming home. And when you're in the military, you obviously have high tech equipment, planning teams and stuff. But this is just you and your mate taking a dinghy across one of the most dangerous shipping lanes in the world. Yeah. What was the trip like and what were the dangers you were thinking about? Yeah, uh, despite my background, it was far as far from a military precision planned uh, event as you, as you could get. So we'd spent the time living in the camp. We'd spent a night sleeping with uh, a group of Syrians who we'd made friends with. It was bizarre, really, because going back to what you're saying about what the type of people they were and were they refugees. And for me, they weren't refugees because anybody who is a refugee who's fleeing from war, persecution, deserves to be helped. And that goes without saying. But the moment you are provided with that help 
and then decide, okay, well, I want to move on to somewhere different for whatever reasons, you give up that status uh, of being. So that's what was happening? Okay. No, that's crazy. No, hold on. Go back, say that again. He was fleeing from war, but with the rest. It was I'm living in the camp. We'd spent a night sleeping with uh, a group of Syrians who we'd made friends with. It was bizarre, really, because going back to what you're saying about what the type of people they were and were they refugees. And for me, they weren't refugees because anybody who is a refugee who's fleeing from war, persecution, deserves to be helped. And right. that goes without saying. Right. But the moment you are provided with that help and then decide, OK, well, I want to move on to somewhere different, for whatever reasons, you give up that status of being a refugee because then you've been given the safe haven, you've been given that opportunity to be safe and you've decided for your own personal reasons that you want to move somewhere else, which is fair enough. Um, I've got a young daughter who lives in the USA. I visit her, spend half my time between the USA and the UK. I'd love to have permanent residency in the USA to be able to go there as much as I can, live there, move there. Who wouldn't? Unfortunately, the world doesn't work like that and that's uh, not the law. So then that doesn't mean I then resort to illegal ways of trying to get that status in the USA. I've got to work. Having safe haven, then giving up that safe haven because you don't like it right here and figuring out how to get somewhere else and then jipping the system again for that same safe like refugee status that's scamming Isn't that scamming you're scamming at this point work towards getting it legitimately the guys we came across said they hadn't just landed in northern france they told us about their stories and it's not me speculating we, we lived with these with these guys we, we spoke to them we listened to their stories they told us that they'd landed in other parts of Europe and made their way to Northern France because they, for their own reasons, whether it's family, job opportunities, um, language barriers, whatever it was, they decided that they wanted to move on. And again, which is fair enough, but they had been provided that safe haven. So at that point that they let go of that status, they then become economic migrants in, in my eyes. We, we saw that side of it and... That's a nice way of putting it, Eco economic migrants. Okay. I say scammers. Because if you're in a and if you're in a better situation, and then you 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 not satisfied with that, and then you give up that status to be refandangled into that status somewhere else, I, that's a little bit scammy to me. Um, but economic that'll do. Uh, dug underneath, and we thought, well, okay, then they're crossing the channel uh, in the boats again, which was all over the news, topical. How hard or easy is it? They're doing it. Could we put ourselves in the same position, live in the camps that are living, and then with very little planning and preparation, do the same and get across the channel undetected and unsupported, uh, as it turned out. We decided to give it a go. We, a friend met us. He came across on the ferry with a deflated dinghy. We purposely wanted it to be not well thought out and planned on purpose because we didn't want it to just be manipulated into something that we could s succeed in quite easily. Yeah. We wanted it to be fraught and have the opportunity of being caught and to be realistic. So he came across on the ferry. Again, the chances for him to be intercepted there. Why is a guy coming across on the ferry in a van with a, with a boat and an engine in the back? He met us. We hadn't even scouted the launch position that we were going to head off from. We just went on Google Maps, looked along the French coast, found what we saw was a slipway into the English Channel, and went, that's where we're going. So, so uh, we just had a pickup from the special agent. Uh, we're on the back of his van. Uh, en route to the uh, drop-off point for the next phase of, um, I don't know, we haven't given it a name yet, have we? No. We'll come up with a name, but uh, we've got the next phase. There's a set in there, I guess. Yeah, we just had a couple of holes in a, in a cemetery, just trying to get some rest. Um, it's dropped now to like two or three degrees. Um, couldn't, couldn't get any, any sleep. Nervous. Anxious, excited about the next phase, or to uh, get amongst it. French for Oh, it? Special Agent H. Yo! Chiono! Hey. <laughs> Why is he dressed like Where's Waldo? Play my supermarché! We went to the slipway in the dead of night, pumped up the dinghy, which nearly woke up the half of France because it was from a, an engine nine, uh, 12 volt battery. small engine on the back 
dragged it into down the beach, put it in the channel, got in and set off for, we had a rough bearing of north. Again, not very well thought out in the pitch black to head towards England. Into the surf, the, the, the initial parts of it were Wait, 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 wait. An Iggy is a, a blow up boat? Would you, that has an engine space for the back of it? This would everybody be fly, coming in on? Was, was really scary. And despite my experience in the Marines, I'm not ashamed to say that I was bricking it. We hit the surf, it was throwing us around, it was pitch black. Of course, we had all the trepidation of what lie ahead of us, and already we were being thrown around in a, in, a, in a washing machine. We eventually pushed through it, got out into the channel, and then the enormity of how small we were in this massive channel on a little dinghy in the pitch black, one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world, and we had no support. Uh, we just had a, uh, quite a close call with a big ship uh, in the dark, because it's really hard to judge how close they are and to lose sort of right upon us. Uh, we went across this front and it's now just over my shoulder. Uh, we're also going off to our right as well, now off to our flank. Um, you can see it. He's quite close, we can see his. That is terrifying. And it's terrifying to me because I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I can't swim. This is something I'd never do. I do not care. I don't play with nobody's body of water. You know what I'm saying? It's not for me. It's a red light for his port side. Uh, so maybe just idle a little bit just to let him get past. Um, yeah, still pretty dark, bumpy, uh, really unnerving start. Nobody knew where we were after we set off. We had our mobile phones waterproofed inside our pockets, wherever they would get signal in the middle of the channel. We didn't know. We had nobody shadowing us. And it just hit me then, it was, something goes wrong, that could be the engine, that could be a puncture, that could be a boat hitting us, getting lost, running out of fuel. Nobody's going to be coming for us. This, this is not like the military where you send a distress call and somebody's there and ready to come and pick you up. Oh, so so that, these massive boats would, would never be able to see you, would they? Uh, no way. It was pitch black, but even in decent conditions, they wouldn't have seen us until maybe the last minute, if at all. And then they're not going to change their course, even if they could uh, at that distance. Yeah, man. Let's, if you get sucked under a, a large boat while it's moving with the engines and stuff going, it's, you're done. You're done. You're going to fall into his, like, propeller path or whatever. You know, them boats be stirring up their own waves and things of that nature. So, look, I don't even know how to properly word boat stuff. That's how far removed from the water I am. <laughs> Jono! Jono! So, we um... We're still in the thick of it, still in the uh, middle of the shipping lane. Luckily, managed to avoid them so far. A uh, bit of swell, chucked us around a little bit. Uh, cold wind coming across as well. Um, but we're doing all right. Uh, sun's coming up now, which uh, is going to bring a little bit of morale. Uh, just means we can see the ships approaching uh, a lot better than we could in the pitch black. And. Uh, yeah, we do, we think we're doing alright. Um, happy, my boy? Again? Happy? Happy as Larry, man. Yeah, our boat's holding up well. Well, they're on an inflatable raft with a go kart engine strapped to it. Off zero hours of sleep. You got me. Listen, there's no level of journalism that I want to achieve where I'm out here like this. Uh, so hopefully, uh, in a couple of hours, we'd be uh, we'd be on the show. And later. You mind? Again? Whose original channel is this on? I I want to go see it. I need to go see if it has. It better have 40 million views. Honestly, if it has a million views, then it was. No, no, it gotta have like five million views for it to be worth it. About five, yeah. Yeah. Hungry? Starving, yeah. We haven't eaten since this morning. Uh, yo, yesterday morning. Yeah, so, um, yeah, yesterday morning. But we haven't been asleep uh, since yesterday morning either, so it's sort of the same day. Um, see you later. There was a lot of anxious moments, a lot of thoughts going around about all the things that could go wrong. Uh, so we think we're over halfway. Uh, we're just sitting in quite a busy part of the uh, the lane. 
there's a big uh, container ship just off to our right it's caused us a little bit of concern we've sort of been heading towards each other for the last half hour or so uh, you can see it uh, we just skipped in front of one of them so that's happy days just hopefully uh, we can miss this one as well now uh, Gary's doing all right you see Gary. Gary. oh there is no this is giving me anxiety there's no way I'm doing this I don't care I, oh my god, I'm trying to even see if like if I had to, would I? Or would I just chill? Yeah, he's not very social, you know what I'm He's getting his head down the old trip. So I haven't said a word. Um uh, <coughs> up now, so a bit better for morale. Still choppy, checking us around. Cold. And, uh, yeah, that's one thing I have do notice, man. Journalists, they be putting themselves in predicaments that are insane, and I give them all the credit. And that journalism stuff is serious, especially when it's this type. Um, bearing wise, we haven't really got a bearing. We uh, we just saw a big, big red mast before we set off, which we knew was the English coast. Head for it, see where we end up in it. Um, but yeah, hopefully, uh, see you on the beach too. How far now? see the white cliffs quite well Dover port is off to the right uh, I think we're heading towards Folkestone uh, it's a bit choppy now waves getting um, a lot bigger and getting cold as well now cold setting the yeah, I can see the waves behind you buddy sitting about here for uh, a few hours uh, so close him in and hopefully it won't be too much longer so you made it over, and how long did it take? Yeah, it took about four and a half hours. We did see quite a lot of ships, we smaller ones and the large ones. It was hard to, to ascertain how far away they were from us. We could see their lights, but being pitch black, we had no reference to how far away that light was to us. Uh, the, depth, the depth perception was not there. Uh, but we pushed through, we made it, and it, we hit a beach in Kent, not far from Folkestone Harbour. High fives all around, because it was a it was a success. That is that is it. We made it. Gario, welcome to your new home, good buddy. England. Just walk right on in. Just not like all right. That was one of the things I was scared about the most, really, was not being able to, <coughs> to accomplish it. And then you're in the news because Royal Marine can't do the... Uh... Yeah, yeah, and that was embarrassing, wasn't it? I mean, Marine can't even get across his own, uh, his own channel to a beach in his own country. So we made it, high fives on the beach, which at this point then, if we'd been an actual migrant boat, of course, it'd be high fives, and then leg it. Yeah. Or the boat turns around, if that's what they do, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, to go back and pick up some more or back to their, their place of origin and yeah the guys on the boat either leg it or hand themselves in whatever the the deal is that they want to do when they get there wasn't as simple for us of course then we had to pack up uh, drag everything up the beach which turned out to be a shingle beach so it was like a travelator trying to get trying to get the engine and everything up it we hit a promenade and the next problem was it was a pedestrian promenade so our friend in the van who was, who'd gone back across on the ferry to come and pick us up couldn't drive down. With all this happening, it took, we were there for well over an hour. The sun had come up by this point, and of course, there were houses facing the beach. And if you live in that part of the world and you see a couple of blokes wash up in a dinghy in the, uh, at the first light, you're gonna probably alert someone, which right. they did. Uh, a couple of local bobbies turned up, questioned us, which initially we, we were taking it quite lightly because we hadn't actually done anything illegal. We had our passports on us, we were British citizens, just out on the channel for, for a day on the boat. Technically we should have checked in with the harbour so yeah we were we had broken a rule but we weren't doing anything illegal. So initially we were sort of playing around with them having a joke batting their questions away and then eventually border force turned up, uh, customs turned up and then... See what I'm saying? See? See? I wouldn't have played with them at all so that's not in my DNA. I would have... Yeah, yeah my bad. I, I, I don't know what happened. Here's my passport. Um, what else you need to know? Yeah, you could search us, check us, whatever you need. I ain't finna play like that. 
and eventually the National Crime Agency. So it started to get pretty serious at that point. I think they, well, they were embarrassed as well because we had pulled their pants down. We'd, we'd breached their defences, got across with very little very behind us too. and exposed them of how easy it was. It was quite a funny moment where the border force, salty old sea dog turned up and he sort of looked at us and he looked, pointed at the deflated dinghy on the floor and said, let me get this right. You've just come from Northern France on that. And we were like, yeah. And he was like, it's four seven sea state out there. He said, not even my cutter boats are going out. That's why you've got across and beat us because it's too rough for our own boats to go out. And then eventually um, we got arrested by, by the NCA. So they thought you were traffickers. Yeah, we, what we didn't know at the point of arrest until we got back to the station where the custody sergeant had to justify why they were holding us was 10 minutes before we landed, two actual boats had turned up about a couple hundred metres down the coast from our position. We found out that their drivers were ex-military, so of course when they were questioning us, what do you do for a living? God damn it. <laughs> it's not looking good for you. Been Mr. West, well I'm in the Royal Marines. Uh, my friend's a former Royal Engineer, two and two together. They must be in cahoots with these other boats who have turned up of actual migrants. They, I believe, they'd got them, got to them as they were hitting the beach. We were arrested on suspicion of human trafficking. Taking it back to the police station, and it was another comedy moment because we did actually have a stowaway on the boat. Anyone of a certain age will remember the sitcom uh, Only Fools and Horses. It's a famous episode. I remember. Chill. I just got done watching that on Patreon where they inadvertently come back from France with a stowaway in the van. In the van, yeah. It wasn't the van. It wasn't the, the, the van, was it? It was the... They had rented a truck. Uh, Gary, Gary, as he's called. Our friend, when he'd come over... Was that to haul him back? That episode? ...over to meet us, had bought a blow-up doll, dressed him up, and put, put a, stuck to Gary's face to it. Morning, everyone. Trump 1 and Trump 2. And... Trump 3. So I didn't even realize that that was what was going on. I feel a bit lonely. Um, gonna make a little bit of a voyage this morning in the dark. So we thought we'd. Uh... Wait, was that to hole and back? To hole and back? Or was that a different episode? Enlisted some help by Agent <coughs> Lee, otherwise known as. Got it. Do you want to introduce yourself to Agent G? Got it. Got, Got it. it. <laughs> So as, well, you probably can't see. Yeah, Gary wasn't trying to go with them, though. He was just he dark. Was um, it's early morning. Uh, we're just on the road from Calais, near Sangat, the original migrant camp. We've got an inflatable boat. It's not the most you everything I've ever seen. Uh, the grand finale of Trump Fix 2019 is we're going to try and get across the channel. Same route that the migrants are using in the boats. Uh, and then hit a beach in Kent. Yeah, 22 miles. It's got a big uh, ask, if anything. Um, however, we love a challenge. We never uh, say no to challenges, so this is certainly the biggest one we've ever done uh, so far. Paul tragically died in a paddle board accident in two oh man, RIP Paul. Yeah, um, we've seen a few uh, cutters, uh, sort of patrol bots coming back and forth throughout the night. We haven't had any Best sleep. Best friend for 20 years. Rest in peace, Trent, too. We've just been set up, um, waiting to go. It's about f uh, quarter past five now. And, um, it's the busiest shipping lane in the world. We've seen the ships moving up, up, up and back, so hopefully we can avoid them, uh, slip through um, a gap, and then hit the beach the other side. As we know, it's definitely the most dangerous and probably stupid thing we've ever done. But um, we're going to give it our best shot and hopefully give you an update from a nice sunny beach in Kent. See you soon, guys. Ngari. Ngari. Bon voyage! So we just coming in towards Folkestone Harbour now. Gary's getting his first little sight of England. There he is. Happy mate. Ngari. Ngari. Uh, there's a couple of boats up. We haven't seen any, any patrol boats. Well, maybe a couple in the dark, we think. Um, there's two boats right up the front, identical, coming across a path. The face of the NCA watching these in front of me and had me in stitches, that's funny. Uh, NC, the NCA is the National Crime Agency, basically the UK FBI, okay. Might be the Border Patrol. Um, 
and see if we can uh, give a wide berth and slip through. And we lift. There was the boats intercepting the migrant boats. Actually, about 500 meters off the shore now. So, of course, when we're getting questioned by these very serious uh, operatives from the NCA, we were just laughing at this. We, the fact that we dad that brought a stowaway uh, across and by the end of the interviews they were actually referring to myself i could see mr west in the don't tell me they was calling that thing gary boat i could see mr dwyer driving i could see gary laying down in the front <laughs> they were referring to him as if he was an actual human being so it was yeah they didn't appreciate that i was laughing when uh, when that happened arrested locked up for about 14 hours questioned released in kent with everything taken off us, phones, which was a drama because we live in South Wales and our friend's van had been commandeered, uh, confiscated as well as part of the thing. So we had to find our way back to Wales on trains. In the meantime of us leaving Folkestone and getting back home to Wales, my house had been raided, doors smashed in, it didn't even wait for me to get home. I mean, they would have known I was on my way back from, from Kent. Doors smashed uh, through. Uh, raided our homes, taking everything that they believed was of worth to them. Damn. Despite the fact that they'd seen my phone videos of us crossing the channel with, with nobody. About four or five weeks later, they, it was no further action and charges were dropped from that. So yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting little um, end into it. Has this experience changed your views on the whole kind of small boats and, and migrants issue? In respects to my belief that refugees should be given help, no matter where they're from, where they are, if we can, we should help them. But at the moment um, they become economic migrants, then no, my opinion isn't that they should be allowed to come across in boats just because they believe they want to go to a different country. So we got to see from, from experiences in the camp and coming across, what a lot of people don't think, a lot of people will say, oh, well, they have. He's, he's phrased it the best so far that I've heard ever, I would say. I haven't just come here from a war-torn country, but we actually got to listen to the stories. The guy told us, the guys told us where they'd come from, how they'd got through Europe. We stayed in a migrant camp on the outskirts of Paris, which was a staging post. Uh, good evening, everyone. Tramp 1 and Tramp 2. I know we've put a, quite a lot of videos on Facebook today. Hopefully you enjoyed them. Us getting gassed yesterday, getting chased by the coppers and getting amongst it. Gas is up again. We're going to head into an area now called um, Paula Chapelle, which is a notorious no go migrant area. Yeah, so as Lee said, we're going to head back into La Chapelle. As we left earlier on, there were guys standing around campfires, starting to um, get a bit rowdy under the influence of drink and drugs. What's what? What's what? Good evening. Uh, here we are. So we're in Little Somalia. Um, there's as you can see here, uh, about a thousand tents there. We're going to go across the road and uh, see what we can find out, have a chat to the guys if they speak to us. If not, then they won't. But we'll still um, walk through there anyway. Yeah, it seems pretty benign at the moment. It's still quite early. It's only about, what, half seven, is it? Um, I don't know. It's still quite early. I've had a few people um, walk past us, double taking, double backing, coming to check us out. Uh, we don't look like we fit here, if I'm honest with you. Get a little bit more edgy as time goes on. So we hang around and it's rammed actually. The tents are uh, literally pushed up against each other, uh, row on row. Uh, but there are a couple of um, areas, sort of off offshoots, see if they're aggressive towards us or whether they accept us. Um, yeah, just see what the feel is and hopefully let's find somewhere we, where we can get away soon as well. We spoke to a lot of people there, and we're like, well, what's the story? Oh, we've come from Italy, whatever it is. We're staying here for a bit, taking stock, and then we're heading to France because we want to get to England. They paid money. Not only just to get there, you've got to sustain yourself um, through that, that whole trip. You, you can't just land with nothing in Southern Europe and get to Northern France without the means. We heard the stories about how they'd got there. They told us about, um, we met a group called No Borders, which was uh, an activist group who believed that there should be no borders in the world. Everyone I heard of them. should be able to go where they want. And they were outraged at this rule that um, we found out to talk to the guys that a lot of them in the, in the camps in Northern France, they, they need help. Why don't they go and hand themselves in to the local French authorities and they'll get support. They'll get someone to live and citizenship eventually. 
and then they could try and legally find their way to England once they become French citizens. We found out one of the rules why they didn't do that and they chose voluntarily, which is a key factor of why I'm against them just coming across on boats is they were living in these camps voluntarily because they could have gone and handed themselves into the French and the rule is that they didn't want to because they'd already been processed in another country, Greece or Italy, somewhere else, which they didn't want to go back to because they thought that was worse than France. Right, right. And the rule was if they did hand themselves in in France, they wouldn't stay there. They would be sent back to where they were first processed, where they, where they were uh, the origin in Europe. And because of that rule, they, they chose to live homeless in the camps in northern France. Which, when you meet them, it does humanise it a lot more than just watching it on the news. Oh, they're illegal, they're trying devious ways to get across the channel. You do meet them, you do feel sympathy for them when you talk to the ones who were friendly to us. And you get their backstory. Yeah, it does put that, that personal side on it. But that doesn't detract from me still knowing that they are purposely trying to break the law and achieve their goals by devious methods. <laughs>